Okay, well, um, I, thanks for inviting me. This I'm going to enjoy. It. I'm really enthused about this talk. It's quite, um, you know, all the different components that make up this rainforest exhibit at the California Academy of Sciences is really staggering. And to make it all together to come up with an immersion exhibit with people to see the different areas of a rainforest. So what we'll do is we'll start out with, we call it the BOLA, or our rainforest exhibit. It, it is set up with regional differences in ecological changes. It's made into four levels. You have the Amazon, which is um, the water level. And then you have the Borneo forest floor, Madagascar, which is the understory, and then Costa Rica, which is the canopy. So the basics of it is there, it is within a 90 foot glass sphere of these four levels. There is a 100,000 gallon open topped Amazon, open topped Amazon tank featuring your iconic gigantic Amazon fishes. Um, it is, the whole part of this is it's an immersion exhibit with um, free-flying butterflies, a leaf cutter ant colony on exhibit, envision, visually um, foraging for plants on public view, as, and as well as um, neotropical passerine species free flight. Also throughout this, as I guess you could say the backdrop, but is very important for this whole BOLA to give the effect is the various plantings that represent the forest, create vertical layering, present, they give um, basic habitats for the birds, nectar for the butterflies. Also within these levels are standalone tanks and terrariums exhibiting various herps, insects, and fish species. So now, here's the goals. These are the goals that we're trying to reach with this rainforest for a thriving exhibit. Maintain temperature, humidity, lighting to support plant and animal health. Sufficient forest growth to create this illusion of a sense of an immersion in a real rainforest. Provide habitats for birds and butterflies. Appropriate waste management within this BOLA. Sust and then also managing sustained healthy populations of free flight neotropical passerines, fish within an open topped Amazon tank, um, healthy populations of animals within the freestanding tanks and aquariums, an adult sustained butterfly population, and a leaf, hunter, leaf cutter ant colony. Okay, so now we have start with our goals and we deal with the challenges that we have to deal with. And that is, first of all, in order for this to all work, we, it was developed a computerized environmental control system with set points for temperature, humidity, and light to sustain growth of the plants to again promote this um, immersion effect. But with all, you know, goals and there are the challenges. So basically the challenges we, we had with this was that at the we had our set points of a constant temperature of humidity. The humidity probably about 75, 80%, the temperature ranging from about 75 to 80. When we opened up the BOLA, it turned out that our humidity was much too low, it was in the low 50%. Our temperatures had what we called, we ran into a syndrome called vertical stratification. And what that means is that basically, in simplistic terms, as you go higher, it gets hotter and it gets drier. And we wanted this constant mix of a constant temperature and humidity. The problem we ran into was on the lower floor, we had temperatures in the low 70s. On the top story, the Costa Rica level, our temperatures were in the high 80s. Our humidity was in the 50s. So we were having some issues developing an environment that was conducive to plant growth. So we found this out that the problem was, was with this, we didn't have the airflow we needed. We needed airflow to mix, um, to allow a more consistent um, temperature and humidity. Also was compounding it was the people. 
the people were in there um, raising the CO2 levels, the CO2 dampeners would open, letting out air that we needed, um, the doors opening and closing, so we had a lot of issues. So what we did to correct this was we basically redesigned our HVAC system to humidify the air before it entered the bola. We increased the airflow. We also, what was also complicating was the sunlight and the overlight blanket lighting that was in the bola was heating it up too much. So we dampened that light, went to more um, target lighting. And that allowed us to help us create this realistic rainforest, which is what you see here, um, where we now have it under control to where our temperature ranges are much more narrow. We're at about a, rather than the low 70s or the high 80s, we're about 75 to 80. Our humidity has come up into the 60, 80, 70 range. Um, so we are getting there. It's all a learning process. So this, at this point, our computerized system isn't going crazy trying to match up to these set points every five minutes. So basically, our goal is creating this real, realistic rainforest environment. Okay, now we have challenges again in creating this, this forest, and that is the use of supplemental lighting to support plant growth at each level. We talked a little bit about the sunlight through the skylights, which you can see, also blanket lighting. We went to more of a focused lighting at each of the levels to um, give the plants light they needed. Um, it also cut down on energy costs, and it also minimized this heat generation, complicating and promoting the vertical stratification. So this again, is a lot of involvement. This isn't veterinary medicine, but it affects the animals in that bola. And there's also the engineers, the stationary engineers that do the work to allow this to happen. It's an ongoing process. Okay, another challenge of obtaining sufficient forest growth is combating pests. Um, we have what we, we practice what we call an integrated pest management that is trying to control environmental pests, not eradicate them, to try to keep a homeostasis within the ecology, not trying to totally eliminate pests. So what we do is we basically hose, we have two types of pests. One are the plant pests. Then we have our nuisance pests, cockroaches and ants. Um, so what we do is we basically do simple mechanical things. We hose off the plants to hose off the, the plant pests. We have volunteers that actually hand clean the plants to take away all those pests. We do have some biological control, our little passerines nip away at the pests on the leaves. We also release um, biological control, predatory insects to try to minimize the amount of pests. But we do, as last resort, we'll use pesticides. Um, pesticides are used very, diligent, or very diligently and um, only if needed. They have to be approved by our, in a, our um, pest, licensed pest, or excuse me, licensed pesticide manager. Um, also, too, all pesticides and fertilizers have to be approved by the veterinarian if they're used in any vicinity to the live animals. So what happens basically is a horticulturalist will determine that, you know, the pests are getting a little bit out of control. We may need to go with a little higher um, level of eradication. That person will, along with the curator of the rainforest, will gather all the toxicological data on animals, do a presentation, and we will then determine the risk versus benefit to use that type of that type of pesticide in the in the bola. Also, there's waste management. Um, we are the bola, which I'll explain as we go on, because of the free fright butterflies and the leafcutter ants, is a USDA containment facility. So, all waste 
needs to be disinfected before it's removed from this bola. The way we disinfect is we freeze at a minus 72 for two days. So anything leaving that's organic has to be disinfected. And we do it by freezing. So at this point, what happens is there's limited freezing space. We just can't. So what we do is we try to recycle as much as possible. All dead leaves and prunings are returned to the forest floor for decomposition. Um, we also, we cull our leaf cutter ant fungus is used as mulch for fertilizers, which minimizes our need for fertilizers. So we try to do about 75% of all waste that's generated within the bola is recycled. So then the next goal that we have, we talked about, is we've now working on the environment. We got the plants growing, you know, things are working well. So now we have to make sure we're managing the our free flight animals. And in this case, we'll talk about our free flight neotropical passerines. We have 11 species of free flight birds um, can, made up of tanagers, finches, honey creepers, probably about, uh, we have a population of about um, 35 to 40 birds at this time. Again, for their general health and well-being, first of all, we need these various plantings. I keep coming back to that, but plants are important. Um, they're important for developing the diversity of microhabitats, opportunity for shelter for the birds. They encourage natural behavior like nesting. We've been able to success successfully breed our blue-gray tanagers, our banana keats, um, our, um, who else? Um, Silverbeak tanagers have done really well in producing and raising young. So we have continued strategies, um, feeding strategies. Um, again, because this is an immersion exhibit with people, we need to place our feeding bowls so that people don't have access to them. The forest floor is fairly easy because we can put them within the planters to keep them away from the people. But on the other two levels, we, have to, we utilize these swinging arm planters that will go out um, and then they can be brought in for servicing and then go back out again. And that is, um, birds are fed on all three levels twice a day. But then we have the risk of, um, since this is an open top tank, we got some pretty heavy predatory fish in that tank, so birds are at risk of getting eaten when they fly too low. Um, some of our, the higher mortalities are our fledglings that really aren't too used to this and they may be at the water's edge getting a drink and boom, get nailed. Um, you also, when you reintroduce birds first introduced into the bola, aren't savvy as to how it all works and if they don't get smart quick, they end up as lunch. Also two, um, altercations. Birds in aggressive phases are chasing each other, they're dipping, they're flying around, and if one gets too low, um, usually the arowana and or the arapaima are good enough to get up and grab those guys. So it's something that we have to be aware of and we try to take precautions to um, at the higher, which we'll talk a little bit about, is that in certain times when, i.e. during introductions, we will, um, we will go ahead and actually this picture right there, there's a nylon net that's over the water. And during introductions of new species, we have a nylon net to give some barrier of protection against the fish. Also during breeding season, during breeding times when we have a lot of fledglings, we place this net again so that it forms a barrier so the fish can't get to them. So we have our bird introductions, which we talked, question? Do you ever have the birds get tangled in the net though? No, not in, not in that situation, no. Um, we've had, in regards to bird introductions, we do the introducing of, of the, the smaller, less aggressive species first 
to give them a idea of the environment, find their little safe spots. Then we release the more aggressive larger birds after that. Um, birds also too, to back up a little bit, the birds are put in howdy cages for a number of days to get them used to their environment. Also shade cloth is put down over the glass areas of the bola to help prevent them from flying into the glass when they're first released. So with the combination of howdy cages, combination of releasing the less aggressive species first, and then followed by the more aggressive species, the um, netting, we've been able to minimize um, fatalities during releases of newly introduced birds. Um, species interaction aggression, it's amazing how aggressive these little birds can be. Um, these silver beak tanager males will fight to the death over territory. Um, there's a lot, actually even brightly colored birds are targeted and aggressed on by others. It can be quite a, quite a dynamic goes on within that bola with those species. So you think, you know, 40 birds in this big of a bola, that's capacity for the amount of aggression that can go along for territoriality. Um, also, we have recapture for husbandry and medical reasons. We have, you know, set cages within the forest floor that um, are basically set up with, um, I guess you say treats or some of the birds' favorite food items. We only feed um, insects in these catch cages so that the birds get used to going into so that we can capture them for either medical or husbandry reasons. We also do other angles of, let's say we have two males that are aggressing with each other. If we catch one male, we'll put that one in the cage and then the other male will come down to fight with it through the cage and then we can net them. We'll also do that with breeding pairs. We'll do some, any type of trickery to try to get those birds into those catch cages for um, dealing with medical reasons, which can be very challenging at times. We have other medical issues. Um, one, first of all, is just zoonotic diseases. This is an emergent exhibit with um, people walking through, so these birds are monitored and surveillance for zoonotic diseases. The diseases that we check are salmonella, chlamydia, uh, mycobacterium, and these birds are monitored and screened during quarantine. They're screened during their life in the bola. Um, on pathology, they're screened again um, to minimize and to eliminate any potential pathological risk, excuse me, zoonotic risk to the visitors. Also, there are some diseases that are inherited in our population, diseases of coccidia, um, which is an intestinal disease and also a toxoplasma, which is a coccidial disease that is more systemic. Um, we manage by um, flock treatments during times of increased, um, I guess say, susceptibility. Um, basically, your youngsters are the ones that are more susceptible, so we will treat in the water with various sulfonamides in their nectar during times of, of chick rearing or um, introductions with, during stress periods. Um, we do have problems with fibers. Um, these little birds will grab you know, fibers, anything off the top of cages. We'll bring those fibers in the nests. Those little fibers get wrapped around the legs of birds. And so we have issues of um, constricted toes. Um, just again, it's getting, now that we have found this out, we eliminate those sources. We, it's again, this whole thing is a learning experience to acquire the most healthy population as possible. So now our next goal is fish with an open top tank. Um, we were faced with the desire, the desire was to display all the iconic Amazon monster fish, um, which looks great, but it's inherent with various challenges. And so one of them is a feeding strategy. This is something that the biologist came up, which is just an amazing event. This occurs a couple, two to three times a week and it's basically set up with four biologists. You have one biologist, the one, let's see if I can get this light going here, right there. He is the, I guess you say the big fish feeder. 
So he source feeds all the arapaima, the arowana, and is basically source or target feeding each of those to keep them all being here fed herring, pieces of fish, prawns. Then you have your second feeder who throws what we call the Paku Fiesta, which is a fruit mix that keeps the Paku in the middle here occupied and away from stealing the fish, stealing food from these guys. Also the fish are set up where, excuse me, the pieces of fruit are real big. It takes time for them to chew, slows them down, keeps them occupied. Then we have a third feeder who actually takes the food in a net, drops it down past the Paku to distribute food to the bottom dwelling fish. Then the, oops, oh darn it. That was a neat picture. Let's see, go back. Okay, then we have our first, or excuse me, our fourth biologist who focuses on our Amazon river turtle. So that Amazon river turtle is then target fed and um, basically it's a Missouri ball, iguana chow. It basically is that animal target fed so he doesn't swim over and grab some of the fish pieces that aren't really part of his diet. So this all occurs in the like five or 10 minutes during a feeding time. So then it would look, you know, some, something like this is what it basically looks like. We got our big fish feeder, Paco Fiat, our Paku Fiesta feeder, we got our bottom dwelling fish feeder, and then here they are target feeding the, um, the turtle. So this is again a challenging, people want to see these, these mixed species exhibits of the various species, various habitats, niches, and it takes a lot of ingenu ingenuity and challenge to allow this to happen. So that's our open top. Then we have another challenges of open top, open top tanks, or of this tank in particular, is philosophy of new fish selection. Right now we're displaying all these giant iconic Amazon fish, but we want a variety. We want smaller fish. We want things to give a more diversity to that pool. And so what we have had success with is the smaller cichlids. And again, the reason in some of that success is what we call the complexities of our exhibit. The complexities are all the hidey holes, all the nooks and crannies, all the places for these fish to hide to get away from the more predatory species. So our cichlid type fish have been very successful breeding and doing well. We've also got a large group of um, silver tip tetras. We put a thousand of them in there. And again, we've been successful because they are on the upper level upper strata, they're more surface schoolers, they're predator and they're little, they're way too small for a Paku or an Arapaima to eat, yet the more predatory fish like the pike cichlid is more mid-level, hiding in the complexities, darting out, getting what it can get back in away from the more larger predatory fish. So they're all at different levels. So this is something that the biologists, the aquatic biologists are aware of when they're doing selections to try to make this exhibit more dynamic with all different sizes of fish from the giant fish down to the small little um, silver tip tetras. Also another problem we have is people dropping things into the tanks. And in this case, this is a picture of a red-tailed catfish which are, have been implicated in the most of our problems of things getting dropped in where they will eat and then we have to then grab them and basically noodle them to go in and get what's ever out of them. And we've got um, everything from sunglasses, we've had um, cell phones, we've had um, baby binkies. It's actually somewhat comical when you see one swimming around and it's sucking on a nipple, on a baby nipple. Um, so these are problems that we have. I actually got to the point when we first started is my annual physicals where I basically noodled every one of them looking for stomach parts and, and things that people threw in. And again, with the education, with what we've done is that's less and less happening. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. That's a, a term that um, I guess in the Southeast that people actually would catch catfish 
a lot of these large catfish by going in the water, sticking their arms into the holes of these catfish. Catfish bite down on them and then they pull them out. So that, that's a, I'm sorry, I, thanks for, for bringing that up. So that basically it's a old um, south, southeast Mississippi, Air, Arkansas, all those areas now is like a, that's a way of fishing is they noodle for catfish. They'll go in, they bite down, pull them out. No, these guys are out. Basically what happens, divers go in, um, they'll catch the fish, they're put in a, a tank. I would then sedate them with some MS-222, um, get them so they can open up their mouths and um, reach down in there and pull them out, pull out whatever, or at least go down in there, feel, you know, doing a gastric exam. Also, too, one of the problems I have is because this is such a, a predatory tank is I don't have any animals to work on. Um, bottom line is any sick animals or dead animals are eaten and I have very, at this point, very little knowledge of what's going on in that tank because I don't treat sick fish, I don't do necropsies in this tank. Um, the predatory fish are that predatory that anything that's a little bit slow is gone. So I do do, when we do our annuals with our catfish, I'll do some scrapings and evaluations on them for health. Um, but that's pretty much about it. So I have to go with the sense that our populations are stable and we're not having any major die-offs, um, so everything must be doing okay. But it is a bit frustrating when you don't have any patients to deal with out of this tank. So then we also have our freestanding tanks, which in each level is freestanding tanks and terrariums that house various herps um, and invertebrates as well. So we have the challenges with these as well, the challenges of maintaining correct environmental conditions. Okay, originally the goal was with this controlled environment of the bola that these in, this environment was also going to control each one of these tanks. You know, it was all these great, and it's, it's, it does work, but we still need to have, pro, we still have to do some type of um, maintenance to get the correct environments. Again, because of the vertical stratification we talked about, it's still too warm at the top. So a lot of our focus on the Costa Rica level is to try to lower the temperature. That is with increased misting, water features, um, various shade cloths from the sun. You know, this is all the type of thing to try to lower the temperature. Then you go on the bottom floors and the focus is increasing the temperature. Um, again, with heat lamps, things like that. Also, um, in one of the important things which you guys probably all know is a thermal gradient is very important in a healthy environment. It's a lot easier to do a thermal gradient when you're bringing the heat up because you can have various hot spots, things like that to allow a gradient for those animals to live in. But lowering the temperature, you have much more trouble with thermal gradient because all you do is lower the temperature. You can't lower the temperature at different levels. So this is also a challenge but is being met successfully by our terrestrial biologists. I also, my part of this is yes, I do have patients um, in this situation. We have animals that get ill, um, animals that die. I'm able to, through the treatment of those animals and through necropsies, I'm able to give a feedback loop to the biologists as to causes of death, trends, was this due to environmental issues? Was the, the environment too dry? Was the environment too moist? Were we getting pneumonias? Was the water features not being cleaned? Should they be cleaned more often? Are we getting um, water contaminants? Um, another problem we have with our animals, and it's an ongoing problem that we manage, is internal parasites. Everybody all has a little bit of a nematode parasite load, which they're all being treated on an opportunistic basis. Whenever we do breakdowns of tanks and cleans, we'll gather all the animals up. In the case of frogs, we may use topical treatments. In the case of the reptiles, 
will go with either injectables or orals or something in their food to again try to suppress their parasite population. So then we have our challenges regarding finding the right species mix. We have all these tanks are various mixes of animals. As example, we have a tank with an anaconda and an iguana. And so you kind of go, whoa. And um, that might be since iguana, and a, you know, iguanas are natural prey, or is a prey item or a food item for um, anacondas. Um, what's interesting, what's worked out well in that exhibit is that this anaconda has been raised in captivity on mammalian prey and is not familiar or has at this point anyway, um, has not recognized this iguana as a, as a food item. So it tends to work. Um, we had this example here. We have a Costa Rican rat snake whose diet is frogs but avoids brightly colored frogs, i.e. concerned about poison. So these, these two animals work together um, in without, without any incident. Another one is the um, tiger rat snake and our red ear tree frogs. Bottom line is the red ear tree frogs just isn't on the menu for a tiger rat snake. And so that works out really well. We have also a mangrove snake and um, river toads. Again, the mangrove snake is an amphibian eater, but avoids toxic, toxic toads or toxic animals. So they're able to do a lot of mixing and matching and through, they also um, diurnal or diurnal nocturnal animals, different, um, they have different uh, environmental parameters will be put together. We actually, it's interesting that you have better, you do better with mixed species exhibits rather than similar animal species because the similar animal species have much more ter ter territorial issues than the mixed species exhibits. So now we do our development of our adult butterfly population. We're permitted to have 30 different species of butterflies. Um, the butterflies, the pupa are obtained from farms in Costa Rica. We get about, we get a shipment of 100 pupa every week that come in. Um, the, they are come in boxes like this, then they pupate and then release. We basically release 100, up to 100 butterflies every week to try to maintain a population of 400, about 400 butterflies to give us the immersion aspect that we're desiring. So basically the challenges with them is we provide them with a food source. We have um, plants that provide them with flowering plants for nectar. We also give them nectar dishes. That's a challenge with them is we, um, we basically what's worked with them is we have enough nectar for them to drink and we have these little, you can't really, I don't know if you can truly appreciate it, but there's like little floating Petri dishes in each one of these so that they can land on it, take their nectar and not drown. And the birds, so this also allows the birds to push away those Petri dishes and then drink from that dish as well. So it gives a, um, a, a sense of where you can utilize one type of feeding container for two different types of species. Also, we have problems with our nesting birds eating the butterflies. Um, in this case, we found out, you know, normally we picked animals that butterflies weren't on the menu um, that were flying. But in case we found out that in, case of, in the case of our silver beak tanagers, which are some of our most prolific breeders in rearing of young, is that during their nesting and hand rearing, they just have an affinity towards the yellow butterflies. And they will actually wait. And when the, the, um, the horticulturist comes with that butterfly basket that we saw, releases the butterflies, they're just all on them, <laughs> grabbing them and pulling them away. So again, you know, that besides it being expensive to lose those butterflies as well as 
decreasing our, our effect that we were looking for, we then altered our, during the breeding and, hand, and breeding and rearing of young, we didn't release the yellow butterflies. We also, um, and so we basically tried to work that out. We also um, tried to disrupt the nesting sites of those potential birds. Um, we just, we did things to, to try to minimize their desire to eat butterflies. We also increased the insect component of their diet, again, trying to dilute out their need for butterflies. Also, too, we have, just like the birds, they are at risk of being eaten by our, by our Amazonian fish. Um, I'd have to say at this point, um, for right or wrong, we, we consider it behavioral enrichment. Um, we aren't as concerned about um, the butterflies being eaten who have a lifespan of one to two weeks as opposed to our birds being eaten. So um, as far as um, butterflies being eaten by, eaten by fish, we don't um, go to any lengths of trying to avoid that from happening. So then along with this, which I've alluded to with USDA containment, is because we have the free flight but non-native butterfly species, we also have this leaf cutter ant colony that we'll talk about a little bit later here, that the goal was to have them on public view while they're foraging. Um, there is a need for USDA containment. Um, USDA containment is we have our, we basically have entry, oops, oops, darn it. We have an entry vestibule, vestibule, and an exit chamber. Um, each one of these is manned by a guest services person who, as the people come in, it's a double-doored system. Um, they will go in, they come out through, and there's the plastic sheeting. Um, this person is in charge of making sure that um, there are no butterflies in this vestibule. Um, also, that um, there aren't any on the people while they're in there. Um, there's also another guest services person at the top Costa Rica level, which is the exit point for the um, rainforest, to check everybody. There's mirrors um, to check everybody so they go down the elevator, then they come back, they come out at the bottom here. Another person's there waiting to check them for butterflies again, and then they leave. Um, if there is a butterfly breach, the bola shuts down. No one can enter or leave until the butterfly is captured and returned. And this, you laugh, but this is very serious. And I laughed, but it is. <laughs> it is very serious because in order for our permitting, this has to be done and has to be done and followed to the letter. Um, I would say a majority, yes. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I would say the majority, they have, but we've been successful. We have a breach probably about once a week. Um, but the majority of those breaches are down in here, into this vestibule. So what happens is the security will call, um, the horticulturalist, biologist, we will respond, we will catch the butterfly, also identify it to make sure it's not a native butterfly that happened to come in and then bring it back into the bola. So during that time, all these doors shut. Um, we have had butterflies um, get out here and down into this lower level in the Amazon layer. Um, but it is something that's very serious. In order to keep our permitting with the USDA, we have to contain those, those butterflies. Um, if you've been to the academy or been to this exhibit, the butterflies are a very um, important part of this immersion effect, and so we want to keep that. So then, last but not least, is the management of our leafcutter ant colony. Again, our leafcutter ants are, the goal was to have them on view, so basically, if you can follow me here, this is the, these are this vine. This is a their food source. They travel down that vine, 
and this is them right here. So again, this is all open. It's a goal that we have um, to allow this to happen. So the challenges of this. First of all, the challenges are just maintenance of the colony. We provide the fresh browse for them on a daily basis. We maintain their fungal chambers. Um, so what's happening here is one of the chambers is being gassed with some CO2 to anesthetize the ants, then these chambers are being cleaned out of debris, um, decomposing fungus, which is then utilized for, um, for um, mulch. But again, that's got to, and, but it's got to be decontaminated from any ants that might be in there. So it's got to be frozen for two days before it's then utilized as the mulch. Um, we evaluate the health of the queen. We make sure the queen, the queen has been restricted to one chamber. These are the various chambers down here. Their entry and exit points of the queen chamber has constricting bands on it so that the queen can't leave, but the workers and the soldier ants can go back and forth, but the queen can't. And so we're able to evaluate the health of that, of the queen during that. And so here's a, basically a hand right here down with a vacuum cleaning out one of these chambers here. So now the challenge, we talked about, you know, we, we wanted the exhibit with ants foraging in public view, so they're coming down this, actually there's a little one right there, um, coming down the, coming down that um, vine after this is with the foraging material right here. This is the chamber bringing the plant material down to um, help fertilize or promote the fungal growth. The fungal growth they utilize for food as well as um, a place to live. So what we have to do is we have to main try to contain them. Um, we contain them because it's a USDA requirement and also to prevent defoliation of our forest. We don't want them out tearing leaves off of all the plants that we're trying to successfully grow. Um, we do this by um, basically keeping, we basically keep the population to a level so that they don't have the desire to spread out. So we keep the population down so that they don't want to leave and start new colonies. If we are to find winged morphs, we will contain them. We'll put constricting bands on their chambers so that they can't get out and then um, deal with them in an appropriate fashion. Um, so again, this is something that takes a lot of effort and time to be able to make this work. Um, our main ability to contain them is with the use of a compound which you're familiar with, Teflon. It's uh, very slippery. They don't like to walk across it. So everywhere where there's the potential of exits, we have Teflon. Um, they, they are made to try to find ways out. Um, we are in our third phase of um, redesign of this exhibit and have still been non, not successful in being able to contain those ants. Um, we determine we find a breach, we find the source of the breach, we contain the ants, and we try to correct it. At this point, what may end up happening is we won't have the full desire, but this, this vine is going to be encased with a clear acrylic tube. So when the ants are up and down, they aren't have a chance to get away. Cool. Just a question. Yeah. Uh, do you have any concerns with using the Teflon in the air environment with the birds or have you any problems with that? No, we have not. Yeah. And so that concludes us with the fact that, um, you know, it definitely takes a team effort, a team effort of, of horticulturalists, aquatic biologists, terrestrial biologists, engineers, um, stationary engineers. Um, we have the veterinary staff, all this, we all work together. Basically, there is three and a half hours of work done each day before the doors open. And that is with eight biologists, um, which are do, there's, Two of them that do the horticulture, the ant and the butterfly work. 
another three do um, the fish, another one and another two do the herps and the other insects. We also have a group of um, custodial staff that come in in the morning and they clean the walkways, clean all the windows to all the exhibits, um, clean the railings, all that to be prepared. We have divers that go in three times a week to clean the acrylic tube for the Amazon tank to be able to, for people to be able to see through it. So it basically takes a large group to be able to make this work. This is just a picture we had. This is us testing the waters when, when the exhibit, before the exhibit was finished. And basically, the, I'm just showing you kind of the same angle of how much um, plant growth has occurred in just the two years that we've been open. So that concludes my, my visit, our talk. Anybody have any questions any further?